Good day. In our ongoing Defense Medical Ethics Center series on bioethics, today we'll discuss public health ethics. As so often, it becomes important to understand the actual effort. Keeping in mind that any ethics is about the enterprise, we need to then define the operational point of public health. And this can be done through a variety of different perspectives, but I think the most relevant comes from the American Public Health Association that defines the mission of public health as the capacity and engagement to assess and monitor populational health, investigations, diagnoses, and address of various health hazards and their root causes, effective communication to inform and educate those publics that are served, strengthening, supporting, and mobilizing communities and partnerships to foster and sustain public health, creating, championing, and implementing policies, plans, and laws, and we'll discuss those laws at the second part of this lecture, that are fundamental to sustaining what publics define to be health, utilizing those legal and regulatory actions to maintain viable health throughout those publics, and in so doing, enabling equitable access to health and health care through a diverse and skilled workforce that is continually self-evaluative and self-improving so as to maintain a strong organizational infrastructure and infrafunctions for public health. Well, if that's the enterprise, any ethics that is going to be focal to that must engage the enterprise in each and all of its efforts. We can think of these overall enterprise missions of public health as being somewhat cyclical. The idea of assessment to then gain policy development to then manifest assurance, monitoring, diagnosing, inform, educating, empowering, mobilizing community partnerships, developing policies, enforcing laws, and creating those laws to link to and provide care and assuring a workforce, which can then be evaluated and therefore be modified and revised as necessary. It's an ongoing process of systematic management that is based at least in part upon developing an evidentiary basis for what public health is and how public health works. So if ethics is really a systematized approach to understanding those moral precepts that can be enacted in practice, and we're speaking about this in terms of medical ethics, how is it then that public health and clinical medicine differ, and how are those ways they're similar, so as to be able to sustain and inform those ethical issues that deal with the problems, questions, and resolutions germane to the practice of medicine within the overall mission of public health. Well, if we look at public health and contrast it with the medical care system, in other words, the clinical encounter, the basic difference is that realistically, public health is oriented to the public at large, whereas the medical care system deals with individuals. In many ways, this is wholly relevant to the practice of military medicine. Recall, if you will, that the basis of military medicine is to care for the collective one individual at a time. In other words, to heal the individual in those ways that are helping for the collective and therefore perseverant to the mission of the medical military ideal, the idea of missional effectiveness, efficiency, and capability. Well, here too, we're, we're dealing with a population. And in this way, military medicine interfaces with public health at large because if we consider the mission of the military, at least in an open democratic society as we have here in the United States and many of our allies, well then the mission of the military is to protect the polis and that polis is the public. So the military medical mission, at least in part, interfaces with the public health mission. And certainly we see that here axiomatically and explicitly in the United States, and that the public health service represents a uniformed service and as such falls under a larger agenda whereby serving the public in that way provides a national service just as the military does. So if you can think of this as a Venn diagram, there is that zone of intersection, but it's those foci, the public versus the individual, as, as is respective to public and individual health, that I think makes some of the issues of public health ethics a bit diverse from those of the explicit interests of the clinical encounter. If we take a look at the ethical issues of public health, clearly we see problems of identification for the group of individuals in assessing what is wrong with them. If we think of the prudential steps of medicine as, number one, what is wrong with this person who has been rendered into patienthood? 
Number two, what can be done. And number three, what should be done biomedically, as well as for the multipartite good of the patient in terms of their roles, their choices, and certainly in the military, their mission and operational functionality within the military operation. But it becomes a bit different when we're dealing with many rather than a singularity. In other words, if we're dealing with a group rather than the individual. And the reason for that is that clearly this has to assume some collectivist ethics, a communitarian ethics, whereby the good of the group is in some way balanced with the good of those individuals that comprise the group. Remember, ethics is all about balance, balancing benefits and burdens, burdens and risks, risks and harms of omission and commission. And when we're talking about the differential ethics of public health and the clinical encounter in in terms of clinical medicine, this too is a balance. That public, that polis is comprised of individuals, each with particular needs, values, and in some cases demands, demands of what a healthcare system, what healthcare practice is required to do for them and with them. But how is it then that we essentially subordinate the individual's needs, at least on some levels, to the needs of the group when appreciating the public. Uh, Not easy. And as a consequence, that then becomes important to develop ethical appropriations to assure that necessary interventions, both in terms of preventions and mitigations, as well as those things that are palliative for populations, are in place. In some ways, this is very similar, if not equivalent, to the medical seric systems developing various treatments. And as you know, in developing those treatments, it becomes important to resolve equipoise. In other words, of the many things that can be done, how do we medically and therefore ethically decide what should be done at this time for these reasons in this person? The translation of public health ethics is pretty much the same. It's resolving equipoise, but not on an individual level, but rather on a summative or integral level that takes each individual and formulates them within the larger needs, values, and therefore responsibilities to that group. And I like to say that ethics has a big mouth, but very often no teeth. That's not to say that it can't yell and scream. It's not to say that ethical sanction or ethical improbities are in any way weak. They're not. But the real teeth of the issue, the things that's going to take a real bite out of the status quo, change that status quo into things that are more usable, and then defend that status quo, is policy and law. And if we look at the individual aspects of medicine or formulating treatment plans, And formalizing those treatment plans, well, policy development for public health is pretty much the same. It creates a formalization of those guidelines, directions, proscriptions, and prescriptions that decide which interventions is or are best for those problem or problems that are identified for that particular public. So if we were to sum this up and look at clinical versus public health emphases, we can see that in the clinic, the emphasis on the individual patient, whereas public health is focusing on populations and institutions. Clearly, clinical emphasis is primarily upon biomedical determinants that then move into more psychosocial determinants of health, whereas public health very often works the reverse. In other words, how is it that various ecological factors of that group at large interface with biological, physical, chemical, and even psychological factors to create a working definition and a sustainability of what that public is in fact manifesting as its health. In other words, how does that public define what is health? And how do we keep that public healthy in accordance with those definitions or perhaps work with that public to modify and revise them? In so doing, in the clinic, we know we have respect for autonomy, privacy, and liberty. And these core ethical principles don't go away. They're just translated into a more collective framework that now recognize the interdependence and interrelatedness of individuals in the group, a reciprocal interrelatedness. In other words, the group is composed of individuals and those individuals are part of that group and the group construct affects them. Certainly, in the clinical encounter, we're very concerned with informed consent as we are with publics. However, here, the nature is public engagement so as to be able to get some level of overall consensus as to what constitutes the public good And that good in the clinical encounter is absolutely defined by beneficence, in other words, doing good, and 
at least non-malevolence, not wanting to harm, if not, frankly, non-maleficence, not engaging harm in practice. But here, once again, we have to translate and balance those goods and non-harms, translating the goods and non-harms to not only the individual, but multiple individuals as they are defined by the collective and consensus of their community. So the ethical issue for public health is one of social good and avoiding social harm, writ relatively large, but also balancing the fact that that large societal group is composed of individuals. And not all of those individuals might in fact be biologically, psychologically, ideologically, philosophically, ethically, and socially identical. A balancing act for sure. And in engaging that balancing act, it really becomes a question of who gets what. Well, this is true. In, in the individual clinical encounter, we're looking at the distributive justice of limited medical resources at certain times that have to be appropriated to an individual based upon a host of factors. Some of them certainly dealing with the equipoise of the clinical decision and the patient's values, but others that are deeply steeped in the economics and finance of the healthcare system. So although we'd love to practice what is called commutative justice, in other words, giving everyone their due rewards and their due regards and resources, services, and goods, in reality, given limitations of resources, either in terms of their quantity or in their availability, we're really doing distributive justice. And we translate distributive justice into the public health arena, and it becomes social justice. What are those goods, services, and resources that are deemed good by that group for that group? And how can we then make those resources available and afford their provision? Well, the public health ethics is in fact represented by the Public Health Leadership Society in coordination with the American Public Health Association, which has developed public health code of ethics, therefore brings together in consensus local and state public health officials, researchers in academia, the Centers for Disease Control, and the APHA. The full guide is published and available to you on the APHA website, www.apha.org. And there are 12 guiding principles. And in that way, as we've tried to illustrate just now, the underlying perspective is, is a bit different than medical bioethics in the clinical encounter. In other words, recall, if you will, as we go through these guiding principles, that the emphasis here is on the collective, the community, the group, not in any way necessarily or intentionally negating or in that way disrespecting the individual, but recognizing the participatory reciprocity of individuals and groups as they exist in the real world. What are those 12 principles of public health ethics? First and foremost, addressing fundamental causes of disease and trying to prevent adverse health outcomes. Uh, this must be evidence-based and as a consequence must also be not just evidence-based medicine, but medicine that is based upon evidence and evidence that has to therefore be viable to that public. Very often, one of the problems we find, at least in the West, if you will, and I, I use the word West in quotes because it's some, becoming somewhat of a dated term, but very often what we tend to find is that there are, in some cases, implicit, and in other cases, explicit biases in the type of evidence that we must use. What becomes important to understand when dealing with public health is who that public is. And that understanding transcends a number of different domains and must incorporate each and all of those dimensions the biological, the psychological, the social, the economic. And in many cases, that changes as a consequence of shifting balances of power, capability, hegemony, and leverage on the global stage. But in appreciating the community, it also becomes important to respect the rights of individuals, at very, very least, that relative right of autonomy. In other words, the negative right of refusal. What may be good for the community may not be good for all the individuals. And in this particular case, we must then balance how those individuals may contribute to the group. More on that later. To be able to gain that consensus, any ethical engagement or discourse must enable opportunity from input from the community members. In other words, nothing about us without us. But even in a given community, there are very often disenfranchised members. And certainly, if we look both nationally and internationally, and more and more, the mission of military medicine is humanitarian in its extent into global stage, we must also appreciate disenfranchised communities and seek to empower them as best possible. 
And to do that, it becomes important to seek current information that is going to be necessary to providing guidance for effective programs and policies. Equally, that same information should be made available to communities and individuals to obtain their participatory engagement, in other words, their individual and community consent via some mechanism of collective consensus. And any ethical approach to public health must do so in a timely way, because very often we recognize that public health issues are time bound. Many of them are emergent as well. Many of them may have subacute and or chronic consequences. So acting promptly becomes an important ethical consideration in any public health disposition. And acting also needs to respect the diversity and variety of approaches that may be applicable, germane, and therefore most relevant to those groups that are being treated. And in that way, we also need to understand the ecologies in which those groups are existing and how they define health relevant to those economic and environmental factors that may be at very, very least contributory, if not predispositional. Enhancing that physical and social environment is, is important. And obviously, to do that also requires use of information about individuals and groups, which must be kept confidential. You know, the reason being is that certainly any form of medical information or biopsychosocial information reveals not only where those individuals are viable for valuable intervention, but also where they're vulnerable. And this then speaks to the professional competence of public health as a practice and those individuals who are the practitioners within its scope. And certainly public health does not exist as a solipsistic enterprise. It must, in fact, work collaboratively, not only with other medical and allied health disciplines, but it also must work collaboratively with the communities it serves to foster trust and in that trust, effectiveness and efficiency. So if we were to sum up the underlying values that provide the foundations for public health ethics, we could essentially reduce these to a core set of eight principal values, fostering a promotion of health and in so doing minimization of harms. These two are interactive. The key goal is to do good benevolence, identical to that of medicine, but straight from the Hippocratic corpus, if in fact I cannot execute those goods which are most focal to my mission, at least I shall not harm. Very often the goal of public health recognizes that goods cannot be wholly maximized, but certainly harms can be mitigated and in some cases prevented. But in treating the group, recall, it also becomes important to respect the constituency. And that dynamic of the individual and the group together must be respected as the constituency and the construct of that whole. And in so doing, it also becomes very important to understand who those individuals are by virtue of their history, their culture, their identities, their needs and their values, so as to minimize, if not prevent, infringement, which is really a politically correct way of saying some form of biomedical imperialism. And the way to do that is to increase and sustain the trust of those individuals who are going to be treated and who are going to be the stake and shareholders of public health interventions. And in so doing, one way to manifest such trust is relative transparency in the intent and methods. And the reason we say relative is there still needs to be some discretionary space. And obviously, what is told and what is not told and how it is told to public needs to be done in a factual way. In other words, veridicality is critical. But as is intellectual honesty, in other words, telling people what you know and what you don't know, and in some cases, exploring those parameters allows some discretion for public health as a practice to be able to communicate what is known at a particular time so as to work in a parentalist fashion, not a paternalist fashion, a parentalist fashion. Public health as an enterprise is morally and ethically obligated to care for the public under the auspices of a care ethic clearly we recognize that there is indeed some asymmetry of capability and power. Just as a parent exercises and recognizes, acknowledges that it is sensitive and responsive to the asymmetries of capability and power between the parent and those who are the moral subject of their charge and their regard. In other words, the child. 
Now, that's not to say that we're treating the public as a child, but we are working in some regard as relative loco parentis. In other words, we're working with that public to define what is good for them and in some cases engage that dialectically. What that public may define as good for them may be recognized based upon the current evidence and best practices as not necessarily the best for them. And therefore, that discourse must be engaged. The ethical process of so doing is truly dialectic. A particular thesis that the public health community advances is very often met by what may be quasi or fully antitheses, antitheses, by those groups that are the subjects of care. And those antithetical postures may be due to a variety of things, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, failure of communication, less than adequate transparency of intent and method, or long-standing practices that, although may have been viewed as beneficial by that public, are really detrimental based upon the evidence at hand. But working together in that transparency, in that confidentiality, in that communication becomes important to create a synthetic approach. In other words, bringing those two theses of defining goods biomedically for individuals, groups, and communities in such a way that what emerges is really a union of those differing, sometimes differing perspectives and a union of those areas of mutual engagement. And that becomes critically important when trying to afford justice in terms of who gets what and what it is that they get. If we then apply this to practice, very often what we see is that unlike in clinical medicine, in the clinical encounter, which is individually based, public health tends more to be programmatically based. And therefore, large scale programs of healthcare and healthcare support are oriented towards those publics that are the responsible recipients of these practices. Often, we're charged with examining the value, validity, and in that case, viability of these programs. Yeah, very often it may be very viable to do. The methods may be valid, but then we have to primarily consider what is the value of that which we're doing. In other words, what are the public health goals of the program? And when examining these goals, recall, if you will, the balancing nature of any ethical engagement. What are the benefits of the program? To who? To what extent? What are the burdens of that program, in inclusive of how said burdens and benefits might be balanced so as to minimize identifiable risks and, in some cases, threats? Can those burdens be minimized or prevented? And is that program to be implemented fairly? And what does such fairness mean? In other words, at the end of the day, what we're really asking is, can and how can benefits, burdens, if you will, responsibilities and risks, be equitably balanced so as to provide a set of services, goods and resources that meet those defined goods of that collective. Well, how do we do that balance? In other words, if I'm telling you balance is important, I think it becomes important for me to give you at least a toolkit, if not something of a step-by-step go-by, how might we then try to adjudicate that balance that interaction of various harms, benefits, risks, and responsibilities. Here, I turn to some of the seminal work of our colleague, Professor Ross Upshur of the University of Toronto in Canada. Upshur's framework identifies four primary constructs that are useful, if not clearly valuable, in putting such ethics into practice in manifesting the balance that is necessary for public health ethics. If, in fact, our goal is to do good, and in doing good, minimize harm, then realistically in defining goods, we must indeed look into or over the cliff of what those potential harms are. In other words, what is the burden of harm for those who may be untreated or those who are treated, defining what are various harms of omission, not doing the thing, and what are various harms of commission, doing the thing. And one of the ways to approach engaging benefits and decreasing burdens is the use of the maximin or minimax construct as originally advocated by the philosopher John Rawls, and that's used in a variety of different ethical discourses. Maximin and minimin constructs can and minimax constructs can be defined and discussed in a variety of different ways and from different perspectives. And some of them are rather complicated in terms of their underlying philosophy and economics. But once again, if we're going to cut through that, as we used to say in my old neighborhood, like a hot knife through butter, 
realistically, what we're trying to do is afford the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of that society or to the least advantaged societies and communities in need. In other words, we're maximizing the benefit to those who have minimum access, minimum provisibility, and or minimum engagement to those relative goods and services. And that becomes critical to understand. In part, such critical understanding also allows us to engage a mini-max concept. And the mini-max concept is minimize harms and maximize benefits. But again, it becomes important to understand how we're going to define what those maximums and minimums really are. And in this way, Upshur defines a least restrictive means process to be able to engage these public health tools, techniques, and implements. In other words, that education and facilitation are preferable, at least as a first step, to any form of intervention or interdiction. Very often when seeking to engage public health practices and looking for an ethical go-by, what we need to understand is that positive learning precedes positive choices. And very often in trying to gain consensus into those things that are definably good for publics is not only a question of communication, but very often is a question of education. And then through that education, communicating and facilitating what those goods, resources, and services need to be. And in some cases, what various restrictions may need to be. Simply acting without that level of public pre-information in other words, without educational facilitation and formation to that public is tantamount to what might be considered, in some cases, overcoming interdiction. That kind of heavy-handed interdiction never goes well. As we've seen most recently, for example, with global health crises, the idea of trying to understand what is important for given populations for given publics? What are the resources? What are the goods? What are the values that are going to be necessary to be able to implement certain things and maintain public health appropriation is key. One need only, for example, take a look at the past 12 calendar months of the COVID crisis and look at some of the debacle, the discourse, and failure of really good dialectic when it came to something as simple as social distancing and wearing masks. Again, Deep education and facilitation, communication and understanding are the precipitants of positive change. And we understand that any form of restriction or suppression must also come with some measures for protection and assistance. If individuals feel that various aspects of their rights, their goods, and their liberties are being infringed upon in the name of public health, it becomes very important not only to communicate why, but also to provide mechanisms and resources whereby said protection and assistance are concomitant. And, and this is also very, very true when we're dealing with large-scale public health data. We'll also talk about technology and ethics, and one of the technologies and ethics that we'll discuss is the ubiquity of data and its relative necessity to manifest any, if not all, of these forthcoming cutting edge, and in some cases, medium, low, and high-tech interventions that are so important to both individual as well as public health practice. But once again, we go back to the idea of confidentiality, we go back to the idea of trust, and it's all contingent upon providing protection and assistance in a transparent way. And what that really requires is understanding what people need, what they value, and what can be provided to them. And Upshur's recommendation is to utilize a form of discourse ethics. In other words, the dialectical process that we described somewhat earlier – Understanding what the public health perspective is going in, understanding that public, that public health ethics will engage, understanding the needs, desires, values, in some cases, ethical precepts and perspectives of those communities that comprise the collective that is that public, and then engaging the necessary dialectic to become synthetic in discourse. In other words, it becomes important to represent the values and voices of those affected. The easiest way to say this is that nothing about us without us. And what this really does is bring us back to the core foundation of public health ethics, which in many cases is very similar, if not identical, to the core ethics of military medicine writ large. The duties of healthcare via the utility of maximizing good 
in communitarian contexts. Good for the individual as part of the collective. Well, if those are the duties that establish particular ethical rules, and we also need to understand that, although I'd love to be able to tell you that good ethics make for good laws, and in an ideal set of constructs, that is the case, what we really find is that what ethics allows us to do is to exercise definable goods within the scope and context of the law. Local laws, international laws, and how then do we develop those programs, those policies, those regulations and laws on a national and international level that bring together soft rules and hard rules to maintain and protect those people that are the focus of public health. This next section will be presented by my colleague, Professor Joseph Procaccino, who will discuss legal aspects of public health and public health ethics and how those legal aspects interface with, in many cases, undergird and overarch with the precepts and purpose of military medicine in public health contexts. I'm sure you'll enjoy his presentation and find it informative, and I thank you for your time.